Welcome to the worship services of the First Methodist Church, located at the head of Texas Street in downtown Shreveport, Louisiana. Join Senior Minister Dr. Stephen Bell as we worship this morning. The annual conference of the Trinity Conference of the Global Methodist Church, say that four or five times. And it, our church was wonderful host to them. Everything that needed to be done was taken care of during this time with the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And uh, our custodians and others have worked hard to get everything ready for us today. It was happening up till noon yesterday. So when you see one of our custodial staff uh, and the ministers express your gratitude to them. We have things that are taking place in the next few days and weeks and we just concluded the conference. Vacation Bible School is scheduled for July 15th through 19th. Always a fantastic program for our children and the leadership will have their training on July 14th. Parents, grandparents, put that date on your calendar. Our summer musical is always a hit, and the blockbuster Oklahoma will surely be so this year, running July 12th through 21st on the weekends in the Emmett Hook Center. Uh, we j so people say, oh, you just did it. We did it in 1998. <laughs> Some of us at certain ages begin to confuse the dates, but it was 1998, so now we get to do it again with a new cast, new orchestra, new directors, and so forth, so it'll be a new show. Our traditional 4th of July celebration is next Sunday, June 30th, right after church, and we have a great meal prepared, including corn on the cob and watermelon, and I, we will have a 30-minute program of favorite patriotic music in a stirring setting in Bain Hall, and where else can we sing and children learn these great songs of love of the country in these days? So be a part of the church family at the dinner table next Sunday. Meal tickets must be purchased in advance and be after church today, phone in, and the office is closed tomorrow, so there will be the available on Tuesday, and that's the cutoff. So if you will, get your tickets. We need to have you at, uh, at the meal. And today, today, we say goodbye to Pastor Ashley Gould as she leaves to serve another church. A reception was held this morning and we filled out Bain Hall during the Sunday school hour for chances to wish her personally uh, the best in this new life. This is a bitter, sweet moment, friend. And now let us quiet our hearts during the prelude time and prepare to worship the Blessed Trinity. Amen.
life flows on in endless song above us lamentation I hear the real the far off him that hails a new creation no storm can shake my inmost calm while to that rock I'm clinging since love is Lord of heaven and earth how can I keep from singing may we pray Almighty God, you have gifted us music and singing. As we gather here in this place, we're reminded of the call that this song should be expressed around the world, a global mission. And you have lifted up your servants who have equipped the rest of us to this task. Let us today rend our hearts before you. Let them be tuned to sing your grace and praise. Amen and amen. Our opening hymn of praise is number 37, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. May we stand and praise God together. Please join me for our affirmation of faith in, on page 691. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. The, the the Crawford family bring their son, Charles Vanderslice, for the sacrament of Christian baptism. Now we celebrate with their family. We celebrate with a family of faith as well. What a very special moment for them and for us. And Charlie, you just look so handsome this morning, and I know you are ready to be baptized. And so 
there are some questions of faith that I'm going to ask uh, for ask Charlie's parents and family, but also I'm asking these questions for all of us. The, the, these questions are for the family of faith because we all have a hand in what God is up to in your life right now and the days to come. So these questions I ask, first of all, do you in presenting Charles Vanderslice for holy baptism confess your faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? We do. Amen. Second, do you therefore accept as your bounden duty and privilege to live before him a life that becomes the gospel, to exercise all godly care, that he be brought up in the Christian faith, that he be taught the holy scriptures, and that he learns to give reverent attendance upon the private and the public worship of God? We do. Amen. Third question. Yeah, he's excited. He's, oh, there's somebody over there. Will you endeavor to keep him under the ministry and guidance of the church until he, by the power of God, shall accept for himself the gift of salvation and be confirmed as a full and responsible member of Christ's holy church? We do. Amen. Last question, and this is an easy one. What name is to be given this child? Charles Vanderslice. Amen. Charles, will you come see me? Look at you. Whoops. There we go. Wow. Look at you and put that arm right there. And I'm just going to hold you and we're going to bounce a little bit. Wow, you got dressed up for this wonderful occasion. You sure did. Look at this water right here. You see this? Look at this. Yeah. <laughs> Charles Vanderslice. I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And I pray God's deepest and richest blessings to be upon you now and all the days of your life. Amen and amen. Charlie, today you have been baptized. And one of the great things that I tell this great family of faith who loves you and loves your family, what I tell them, I'm going to tell them again today, and that is that baptism for these little ones is not a spectator sport. We are reminded of what Jesus says to us. Let the little children come unto me and do not hinder them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of heaven belongs. And so we all have a role. In fact, we're going to make a covenant today with God and with Charlie and with his parents and with his, with his family because, Charlie, we're going to surround you as best we can with the gospel. We're going to lead and live lives following Jesus as an example for you. And we're going to minister to you and share the love of Christ with you. We're going to do that because our hope, our prayer is that just as today is such a monumentous occasion, there's a day in the future when you will place your faith in Jesus Christ personally and publicly, and that will be a momentous occasion as well. And between now and then, and even after then, we all have some wonderful work to engage in together. And so the two of you do not have to do that all by yourself. You've got a big role in the discipleship of this young man. But we're going to join you in all the ways that we can. And so what I'm going to ask you to do is turn to your bulletin. The front page. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we have witnessed this baptism God requires that we be accountable for our part in the welcoming of this child into the household of faith. Therefore, I hereby commend him to your love and care. Will you join me in our congregational response? Charles Vanderslice, we welcome you and receive you into the fellowship of the church. We promise to surround you in a community of love as, as you grow in Christ so that you may confess the faith of Christ crucified, proclaim his resurrection, and share with us in the royal priesthood of all his people, to the glory of his name. Amen and amen. Good job, Charlie. Good job. You did so good. You did so good.
All right. Thank you so much. You may take your seat. Ye people, rend your hearts, rend your hearts and not your garments. For your transgressions the prophet Elijah hath sealed the heavens. Through the word of God, I therefore say to ye, forsake your idols, return to God, for he is slow to anger and merciful and kind and gracious. And repented him of the evil. If with all your hearts ye truly seek me, ye shall ever surely find me. Thus saith our God, if with all your hearts ye truly seek me, ye shall ever surely find me. Thus saith our God, thus saith our God. before his presence. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might even come before his presence. Come before his presence. Oh, that I knew surely find me. Thus saith our God, he shall ever surely find me. Thus saith our Amen. Would you please stand for the reading of God's holy word? Our scripture is from the book of Joel, chapter 2, verses 12 through 14. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and relent and leave behind a blessing, grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God.
Well, good morning. We invite any children to come down. Good morning. So, have y'all ever forgotten anything before? Maybe you forgot to brush your teeth. Yeah. Maybe you forgot to do your homework. Or maybe you forgot a sweatshirt at school. That lost and found just seems to get bigger and bigger. So, I am notorious for forgetting things all the time. And most of the time, it's my school keys. A weekly basis, I always forget my school keys. I'll be in my car, driving to school, think everything's great, and then <gasps> I forgot my school keys. And some days, I'll just say, nope, I'm running late, I gotta keep going. And I forgot my keys, and that's with me all day. Every time I come to a locked door, <sighs> I forgot my keys. But sometimes I stop, and I'm like, oh, I've got to get them. And I turn completely back around, and drive all the way back home, and I get them. And I look for them, and sometimes when I find my keys, I feel like the keys are looking up at me, and they're smiling. Like, yeah, <laughs> here we are. You forgot us again. And I just, whenever I get them, I feel comforted. Like, okay, now I have them, and I feel so much better because I found them, and I turned back around to get them. And that's exactly what Jesus wants us to do. Whenever we forget about him, he wants us to stop turn completely around, and come back to him. And just like the keys were smiling at me, I feel Jesus smiles at us when we come back to him. And the scripture reading was from Joel, and Joel was telling the people to turn, return to God, come back to him. And he was saying it in such a way that it reminded me of uh, your parents and their cell phones, and they get that weather alert and it's really loud, and it kind of scares you almost. And I feel like Joel was that weather alert. He was that warning, telling everyone else, return to God, return to God, and he will be there smiling and comforting you. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so very much for these children. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to return to you. Please be with us this week and bless us with your love and comfort us and guide us. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much, Ashley. Thank you, children, as well. What a beautiful time, our children's message. And it's always, you know, it's not just for our children. It's for all of us as well. So we are grateful for this message in the earlier portions of the service. As our ushers come forward to receive our gifts and our offerings, our tithes to the Lord this day, I want to remind us that there are multiple ways to give our offering to the Lord, certainly as the plates are passed here in the sanctuary, but also on the bulletin, you have some information there, a QR code even that can take you to information on how to uh, give your offering online. Of course, you can always mail your offering into the church office, or you can bring it into the church office during the week as well. We'd love to see you in the church office, just like we love seeing you here in the sanctuary on Sundays as well. But at this time, I invite us to bow our heads together, and will you pray with me, please? Kind Heavenly Father, Almighty God, you are so good, so glorious. You are beyond anything we could ever comprehend, yet as close as our very next breath. You are Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. You are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And from this divine, eternal relationship, you call us into relationship with yourself. And God, when we say no, when we say no to this relationship with you, when we turn our backs on you, when we go our own disobedient way, you don't say to us, good riddance, I have plenty of sheep in my flock, I don't need you. No, what you say instead to us is return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning, return to the Lord your God, Father. 
You have such immense expectations for your people. Your standard for us is set so high. And we're grateful for this because for all our days, you choose to call us to the life that truly is worth living. Your judgment is swift and sure, yet you are gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Your desire is to bless your people and blessed we are. Father God, I thank you today for your church, for the body of Christ, your redemptive fellowship. I thank you for those of us you have called out of the darkness into your marvelous light. And you've called us out of our comfortable lives to trust in you, to follow your son obediently, and to faithfully share the good news of salvation with all those you place along our path. I thank you for this church particularly. First Methodist Church of Shreveport, Louisiana, for the historic witness of this great church and for the recent witness of this great church in hosting the 2024 Trinity Annual Conference over the past three days. Jesus, we give you thanks for every yellow shirt and the saint who was wearing it every door that was opened, every question that was answered, every cup of coffee that was brewed and enjoyed, every smile that was shared with one of our 1,100 guests, every act of Christian hospitality, every ride on a golf cart, every time that Christ was offered and shared, every child shown the love of Jesus in our nursery, every angel entertained, every sermon that was preached, every prayer that was prayed, every hymn that was sung to you, O Lord, every man and woman consecrated and ordained into Christian ministry. Father, we saw your church at its very best this week, and we thank you. We thank you, Jesus, that you are our healer, the great physician. We continue in our prayers for Gloria Smith and Chris Harbuck, who are in the hospital, Donna Bell and John White, who are on hospice, Dr. Bill Hathaway, Dahl Moore, and Roy Prestwood, who are recovering. We pray for Donald Crow on the death of his wife, Sue, who recently went on to glory. And we give you thanks for the birth of Matthew Hutton Montgomery, born to Robert and Annie. Proud grandparents are Allison and Jerry Montgomery. We know the world is a better place now, Lord, because of Matthew Hutton. And we give you thanks for the baptism of Charles Vanderslice Crawford today. What a beautiful moment of worship that was just now. And Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for our dear friend, sister, and pastor, Dr. Ashley Goad. We thank you for her life and ministry that she shared with this church for nearly 11 years. For every mission trip, for every mission partner who was welcomed into our church family, for every sermon quiz, for every bit of wisdom that was communicated in a classroom, in a worship space, at a table, in a meeting, at a bedside, for that gentle, genuine, and generous spirit that you placed within her, yet could not be contained within her. For her faith, hope, and love, we thank you, Jesus. Father God, we thank you for this great calling you place upon our lives, how it brings us and how it takes us. As Ashley, Chris, and Mac embark on this new adventure, anoint them all with your Holy Spirit for the task at hand and consecrate them for this new assignment. Shepherd them in this transition. May their new congregation in the woodlands receive them with joy and gratitude. May they know how loved they are. And may their ministry in this new setting strongly influence others to worship passionately, love extravagantly, and witness boldly. For we pray this in the holy name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I
joys and comforts die. I know my Savior liveth. What though the darkness gather round, songs in the night he giveth. No storm can shake my inmost calm, while to that rock I'm clinging. Since love is Lord of heaven and earth, how can I keep from singing?
be seated. Just a word of thanks to begin. That was the most beautiful reception. I don't think I've ever been hugged as many times in a 45 minute period as I just was. So thank you for making that happen, all of you. But hear the word of God proclaimed by Joel, prophet bold, a message stark, a future dimmed, a story to unfold. The land mourns, the fields lie bare, a plague of locust nears, devouring crops with ravenous flare, erasing all that cheers. Wake up, O Judah, Joel cries, repent before it's late, for sin has brought this grim surprise, a devastating fate. He paints a picture, dark and dire, a day of judgment near, when skies will burn with searing fire and hearts will quake with fear. But hope remains, a sliver thin, a chance for change, a plea to turn from wicked ways within and fall upon your knee. Fast and pray, the prophet calls, rend garments, show remorse, for God is kind and hears your calls and offers mercy's course. If hearts are rendered, tears are shed, if true repentance takes hold, the Lord may yet avert the dread and stories yet unfold. A promise gleams, a future bright with rain that quenches thirsty ground and harvest full, a joyous sight where blessings may abound. So heed the call, O Judah's sons, and daughters, mend your ways, lest locust strips and darkness runs and sorrows fills your days. For God's a shepherd, ever true, who seeks his flocks astray. Repent and turn, there's hope for you, a brighter dawning day. Yes, friends, we are in our final week of the sermon series called Majoring in the Minors, where we've been treated to a quick overview of three of the minor prophets, Malachi, Amos, and Habakkuk. And our prophet this week is Joel. Joel. Good job, everyone. So open up the, your bulletins, take out that sermon quiz for just one last time. Joel, the 29th book of the Bible. It's the second of 12 Old Testament books categorized as minor prophets. And in case you haven't picked up over this over the last few weeks, let me say it again. There is no such thing as a minor prophet. A prophet is one of the three offices in a theocracy. You know, a theocracy, a government where God reigns as the ultimate authority. And those three offices of a theocracy are king, priest, and prophet. And no matter what a king might tell you, the prophet ranks the highest as they communicate God's message directly to the people. But back to Joel. In case you missed the summary in the opening poem, let's just pretend that I'm your Old Testament professor for today, and this is your crash course on the book. These three chapters are packed with prophetic poems that are both powerful and puzzling. Unlike many prophets, Joel doesn't specify the time frame of his writings. Most likely, though, it's set in the Ezra and Nehemiah period after the return of the exile, because Joel does mention Jerusalem and the temple, but not the kingdom. What sets Joel apart from his, is his deep familiarity with other biblical texts. He quotes or alludes to major and minor prophets, as well as the book of Exodus. Now, interestingly, Joel never accuses Israel of any specific sin. He assumes his audience knows about Israel's rebellion from their readings of other prophets. So reflecting on these earlier scriptures, it helps Joel to make sense of contemporary tragedies while instilling hope for the future. When you take a closer look at Joel, it reveals his profound use of the phrase, the day of the Lord. 
Now this phrase describes moments in history when God intervened powerfully, either to save his people or to confront evil, just like the plagues in Exodus. These historical events foreshadow a future day when God will once again confront evil and bring salvation to the world. To illustrate this theme, Joel's book employs parallel poems. In chapter 1, he recounts a past day of the Lord, likening a locust plague in Israel to the eighth plague of Egypt. Joel urges the elders and the priests to deliver the people in repentance and prayer. So chapter 2 prophesies a future day of the Lord, describing a looming disaster for Jerusalem. Initially, Joel compares it to another locust invasion, as you do, but it morphs into a military threat with cosmic implications. Joel again calls for a heartfelt repentance. Rend your hearts, not your garments, and return to your Lord. In other words, repentance can't just be a show that you put on to get out of trouble. Rend your hearts emphasizes genuine transformation over superficial displays. Joel then reminds the people of God's character, quoting Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. God is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, full of love. Knowing God's mercy exceeds his judgment, Joel leads the priest in earnest, in earnest prayer for God's forgiveness and restoration. And then suddenly, the narrative shifts as God responds to Joel and the people's repentance with compassion. He pledges to reverse the day of the Lord from judgment to salvation, restoring the land and promising his presence among his people. It's through these poems that Joel confronts Israel with the consequences of sin, but he offers hope through God's great mercy. He calls them to repentance, promising abundant blessings and restoration for those who seek God with their whole heart. It's a profound reminder of God's faithfulness and his mercy throughout history. So Joel's book, it's not just about prophesying events. It's a call to understand God's character, guiding his audience to seek genuine repentance and experience God's loving and enduring restoration. Which brings me back to today. You've likely already heard during the service that it is my last Sunday here at First Methodist Church of Shreveport, as I'll soon be transitioning to the Woodlands Methodist Church in Texas to serve as their pastor of missions. And it seems as though the first moment that I said yes to this position, the trials and tribulations came at me full speed. Of course, we had to sell a house. Always a treat. And then the day the movers came, the buyer's loan fell through. In the midst of that, Christopher, my husband, went into AFib after an eye injection gone wrong. So because of that chaos, I canceled my trip to Romania and Czech Republic to spend time with our mission partners. But I did get on a plane for Thailand to meet our Russian and New Zealand partners, only to break my foot the first moment, first hour that we arrived. Upon arrival home, I scheduled a visit to see my favorite orthopedist, only for a very kind fella to run a red light and hit my car. (laughs) Yes, laugh with me. And then there was last night. I thought we were in the clear, but we spent the night in the emergency room because Chris brought a bug back from South Africa. And I just kept thinking to myself, God, what is going on? Nearly every day I was bawling my fist at him, questioning my decision, even questioning my ability to do the job at the Woodlands. And not to mention there was the emotional turmoil that came with leaving the church that I dearly love. So I camped out in this book of Joel, reflecting on God's character, and in my heart I was reminded, just be faithful, Ashley. Just be faithful. Perhaps these bumps were simply a refining before stepping into a new calling, 
or an exercise in rending my own heart. And as I sat on those long plane rides from Phuket and from Cape Town, I thought long and hard about what I wanted to say to this great church and how I wanted to say it. I kept reading through Joel's prophecies along with Paul's letters to the early churches as he reflected on what the churches had taught him. And that's where I landed, a Paul-esque letter to weave together my final thoughts and these lessons from the prophet Joel. So if you will, indulge me for just a wee bit longer. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, this is a letter from Ashley, disciple of Jesus Christ, child of the most beloved God. I am writing all of God's holy people in Shreveport who belong in Christ Jesus. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you much grace and peace. As you know, for nearly after nearly 11 years of walking this path together, the Lord has called me to a new chapter in ministry. It's hard to express my depth of gratitude for the time that we've shared. This church, this community has woven itself into the very fabric of my being. Think back with me, Will, to that very first day, August 1st, 2013. New faces, new beginnings, a spark of hope in the air. Over time, that spark grew into a fire, fueled by the relationships that we built. We learned, as the Bible teaches, that we are called to abide, to dwell in God's presence, yes, but to also dwell with one another. Henry Nouwen's wisdom rings true. Dare to love and to be a real friend. The love you give and receive is a reality that will lead you closer and closer to God, as well as those to whom God has given you to love. Indeed, Joel's emphasis on genuine presence resonates deeply as well. Just as the people of Israel were called to return to the Lord and community, we too are called to cultivate strong and authentic relationships with one another. Our faith is not meant to be lived in isolation, but in the context of a supportive and loving community. In our own lives and in our faith family, we are reminded of the importance of relationships. Our faith should not be a mere project or a checklist of tasks to complete, but rather a deep and meaningful partnership with our Lord. It means abiding with Christ and being in such close communion with him that our relationships with people are an extension for his love for us. It means lavishing our, our friends with love so that they can live into their callings to make disciples and to transform the world. It means creating family through love that binds us together and being an instrument of the connection in the body of Christ. Yes, these relationships should be characterized by kindness and grace and forgiveness, mirroring the love that God has shown to us. As Paul reminded the Thessalonians, we are called to encourage one another and to build each other up. You, First Shreveport, have taught me this principle, that our faith not only connects us to God, but to each other. We are called like branches on a vine to abide in Christ and in one another. And indeed, this is a lesson that we took into the mission field. Our partnerships haven't been just about getting things done, although much good has been accomplished. But we learned, and as Paul wrote to the Philippians, to stand firm in one spirit, contending as one person for the faith of the gospel. Our partnerships have been about forging faithful friendships, a testament to the love and power, the shared love and service in Christ. Perhaps, though, the most important lesson that I've taken away is the simple yet profound ministry of presence. By nature, if you know me, I'm a bit of a task-oriented person. God has given me the gift of efficiency and multitasking. But when we read through the Gospels, we see Jesus sitting with his friends and walking with his colleagues. We see him eating. We see him listening. We see him simply being present. So I wonder, how often do we take the time to be fully present with those around us? 
That principle shaped our missions ministry here at First Shreveport. We sought to be like Jesus. We walked alongside our partners in their journeys. We've shared meals and encouraged their hearts. We've listened to their stories, cried with them through their difficulties, and lavished the love of Christ upon them. Yes, church, I believe the most important gift that we can give to another is the benefaction of our presence. Just like hundreds of you did over the past few days when we hosted our annual conference. It's an unforgettable gift when we are lovingly and emotionally present with the others in the now of our lives. The gift of presence to those whom we love doesn't bend or break our finances, but it does require connecting with our feelings and our emotions. It demands intentionality, the burning of psychic energy, and seeing with the heart. Yes, that ministry of presence is a way of being rather than a way of doing or a way of telling. It's a listening ear, a hand-held type, a silent prayer offered alongside another. Yes, these are the gifts, the simple, sacred gifts that we can all offer. And you, my dear friends, have been my teacher of this powerful ministry. You've also instilled in me an attitude of gratitude, yet another lesson that that prophet Joel speaks to. In the midst of trials and hardship, the people of Israel were called to give thanks to the Lord for his faithfulness and his provision. And as we navigate the ups and downs of life, we too must cultivate a heart of gratitude, recognizing and thanking God for his countless blessings in our lives. I think I've learned this lesson best when sitting at a table. Did y'all know that Shreveporters love to eat? <laughs> and indeed, tables are a place for human connection. It's where hospitality and reconciliation are at their best. We're often most fully alive when we're sharing a meal together around a table. And in fact, it was around the table that our Global Mission Committee became a Global Mission family. And God certainly has a way of showing up at tables, doesn't he? The table of Passover, the table of communion. N.T. Wright once wrote that when Jesus himself wanted to explain to his disciples what his forthcoming death was all about, he didn't give them a theory. He gave them a meal. You, my friends, have gathered with me for many, many meals in your homes, in my home, in restaurants, in the other countries, in the good times, and in the scary times, in the celebratory times, and in the just plain everyday times. As Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And I give thanks for your presence at the table in every season of my life. Not too long ago, I was recording an interview with Costa Rica missionary Will Bailey for the Broken Banquet podcast. That was a shameless plug. You can download the Broken Banquet on all your favorite podcast platforms. And Will asked me what was the one legacy that I hoped to leave with First Methodist Church of Shreveport. My immediate answer was that I hope I've taught our faith family how to love others well, how to listen, how to be present, and how to empower those around us to live fully, fully into the person that God has created them to be. Loving people well is at the core of our calling as Christians. Just as Joel calls the people to return to the Lord with all their hearts, we too are called to love God and to love one another with a full heart. And that love should be marked by compassion, with kindness, with grace, reflecting the love that God has shown to us. And as we extend this love to those around us, we become vessels of God's love and grace in the world. And so, my friends, as I reflect on my time with you, I'm reminded of the many ways that you have embodied each of these principles. Your generosity, your encouragement, They've been a testament to the power of God working through his people. And as we part ways for now, I hope we'll all remember Joel's message. God's faithfulness endures. 
His love is unchanging and everlasting, and we are called to embody his love in everything that we do. And just one last thing. Paul ended most of his letters by exhorting specific members of the church. And so, my pastor friends, I'll do the same, but I might not look at you. Oh, sweet Pastor Kathy, she asked a lot of questions. <laughs> she's curious, and she's so eager to know all of you. So take her out to lunch and abide with her at the table. And likewise with Pastor Emily, introduce yourselves to her every time you see her, at least for the next three months. Make a point to simply be present with her. And lift up Pastor Stephanie every chance you get, for she is the gentlest, most hospitable person I know. And Dr. Hobson, indulge David every now and then. <laughs> Laugh at his Star Wars metaphors. <laughs> Listen to his musical stories. If you all didn't catch it today, he and I once hosted uh, a podcast, a teaching lesson for 10 weeks called How Can I Keep From Singing? And that's what he's been singing through the choral times. He has so much to teach all of us with his wisdom and his logic. And Dr. Andrus, Will has been with us the longest. What a good and faithful servant he remains. The way he loves and cares for his wife, Julia Ann, is a constant inspiration for who I want to be as a spouse. May we all love as he loves. And Pastor Matthew, he and I are kindred spirits and I will miss him. He's jumping into a great position of leadership as your new executive pastor and his responsibilities will be many. Be kind to him and always say yes to him when he asks for your help. And then there's Stephen. Oh, Reverend Dr. Captain Stephen Henry Bell. <laughs> <laughs> My friends, pray for your senior pastor, for he has the most responsibilities. The past couple of years, he's seen you, he's seen us, through the darkest of days, and even some of our brightest moments. It cannot be easy serving both First Methodist Church and the Army, while also being present for his family, for there's only so many hours in a day. So whenever you have the opportunity, pray for him. Encourage him, for he is our chosen leader. May God continue to bless this church family abundantly. May, oh, I can't see more. May your light continue to shine brightly in Shreveport and in all the world. Live into your calling as a beacon of hope, a beacon of love, a beacon of unwavering faith. Though our paths may diverge for a time, remember the bonds of Christ unite us eternally. Go forth, my brothers and sisters and continue to do the good work. Amen and amen. song. <laughs> How about a hymn? Because within my heart, there is a melody. It's number 144 in your hymnal. Remain standing and let us sing together.
Well, before we go this morning or this afternoon now, I uh, certainly want to take just a moment and say a word of thanks to all of those who has le have led us in a powerful time of worship this morning. So grateful to Ashley Hill for that beautiful children's message. Once again, grateful to our children and, and the way that they lead us every week for our acolytes and all of our children, for those running our technology, for our ushers as well. So grateful for our great pastors here today. So Pastor Emily and Pastor Kathy and Pastor Will and Pastor David, Pastor Ashley, thank you for that wonderful sermon today. Thank you very much and uh, grateful for those leading us in this very special time of music today. Well, Kara, thank you for all the beautiful piano playing and for Gary, beautiful solo and for the choir. What a beautiful anthem that you shared with us today as well. We are so blessed to be here in the house of the Lord. I also want to say a very special word of thanks to all of those, uh, too many to begin naming, who helped to host the 2024 Trinity Annual Conference of the Global Methodist Church here at First Methodist Shreveport over the, the last uh, course of the last three days. There are a few people I do want to thank, though, by name, and Pastor Stephanie is one of them, and Debbie Williams is another of them, and Beth LeBlanc, and Brett Radabaugh, Kathy Lamb as well, who did so much uh, in, in terms of plans and preparations. Uh, there's so many more. I, I, I got to thank Jay Sawyer. I've got to thank uh, Claiborne Sharp up in the sound booth as well, and so many more. I mean, this is planning that says been taking place over the course of the better part of a year and so it came together and what I want to say in summary for hosting the Trinity Annual Conference here is that the the presence of God's Holy Spirit and the prayers of God's people saturated every inch of this church every inch of this facility over the course of those three days and we are so blessed to have had the opportunity to have hosted this conference, but we're also so proud of so many people who served Jesus Christ and his church by serving over the course of these three days. There will be more to come about annual conference in weeks to come, but I just wanted to say that as well. Um, I'm going to think that, Ashley, you're going to be around somewhere that people can maybe ride around, right over here. So if you didn't have a chance to visit with Ashley at the wonderful reception, and again, thank Thank you for those who hosted that reception for Ashley during the Sunday school hour. If you didn't have a chance to do that, or I guess even if you did, uh, she'll be right over here. And I guess maybe by about five or six o'clock tonight, you'll get to go home. Um, but I know you'll want to continue to show your love for her. And also, as I said earlier, Continue to lift up Ashley and Chris and Mac as they make this transition. Lift them up in your prayers. Bless them. And, and may that prayer blessing continue in the days, weeks, months, and years to come. That God will continue to use her in the ministry of his church and kingdom in such powerful ways as he has used her here at First Methodist Church of Shreveport, Louisiana, and beyond. So I hope you have a great rest of the day and week. And between now and the next time we gather as this portion of the body of Christ, may we be mindful that the harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few, but we are blessed. We are so blessed to be a blessing. So friends, bear witness to the love of Christ in this world so that the stranger you meet may find in you a faithful friend. The grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and be with each and every one of us now and forever. And may all God's people say, Amen. Things are mine since I am his. How can I keep from singing? No storm can shake my inmost calm while to that rock I'm clinging. Since love is Lord of heaven and earth. How can I keep from
You've been worshiping with the congregation of the First Methodist Church, located at the head of Texas Street in downtown Shreveport, Louisiana. We welcome you to join us in person next Sunday at 8.30 or 11 a.m. For more information about First Methodist Church of Shreveport, please visit our website at firstshreveport.com. Thank you.